see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hand a wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I pray for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes. Illumine me. Spirit divine. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am just elated to have the privilege to be here with you today. The invitation came at a time probably largely due to my association with the Reverend Ebony Grissom, who just introduced me, who happened to be working in this community. So, out of my loyalty to her, because I spoke at Duke University years ago, she was the student they sent to pick me up at the airport, and I felt indebted to her. So I said, yes. I really, at the time, did not know much about you, but I have come to know a little bit more about you. And let me tell you, as I get started with my presentation, who you are in my eyes as a result of reading the literature about you, hearing anecdotes about what you do, and notes about what you do. And I think have some confirmation from high heaven about how significant you are. And I'm honored to have a privilege to be a part of you today. But more importantly, to be joined in a movement where you are central to it, and I'm a part of it. So let me tell you who you are, the way I see you. And after that, I'll get down to business and share the keynote that I'm supposed to offer. Well, there is a passage of scripture that I happened on Since our nation has been plunged into uncharted paths of living out our destiny. So, in trying to have some insight into where are we, I ran across this text. I'm going to read two texts, one from this passage and a, a, another text that helps me to define you, the way I see you. From 2 Timothy, chapter 3, I'm going to read just five verses. You will find it strange that the Bible over 2,000 years ago would write a paragraph like this. How did the Spirit know that times will come like these we're living through? This is what it says. You must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, prophets, 
brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid them. I could not believe that that passage was actually in the Bible. And this is the New Revised Standard Version. <laughs> so clearly, these must be the last time, which is what one lady told me after our election. She said, well, seems like these are the last days. <laughs> but not to worry. I did, for a while, depressed, for a while, destroyed, for a while, oh Lord, what, what, what shall we do, kind of thing. But then, something lifted my spirit, because there's another reference very close to this one that speaks about what happens when you think it's the last days. It said, and this comes from, well, let me make sure you understood. The first one was from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And you will notice that today I will be dropping lots of texts. That's only kind of like being professorial, giving assignments or the study for the rest of the year. So I'm not going to be trying to exhaust these things, okay? But the other text is from Acts chapter 2. I've already read from 2 Timothy 3 about bad things in the last days. But this is another text that lifted me up even more than the meds that the doctors gave me for my depression. <laughs> it says in this text, Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. Still talk about the last days. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I think maybe that's about 17 and 18. Can you see how that turned me around? That no matter how bad it is, don't think that God has gone to sleep or is on vacation in Miami. <laughs> no. When it gets that bad, then God sets out to recruit. Well, let me put it like this. Do you remember in 1992 when we were being challenged by the athletic prowess of those basketball players in the world and we were getting ready to go back to the Olympics? And the decision was made by the American United States Olympic team that, you know what, we cannot rely any longer on just these college players. We better send to our Olympic team some folks that are capable of handling the situation. We, we, we really are tired of being beaten up so badly. So, you will recall that in Barcelona, they put together what they call the dream team. Oh my goodness, and the, uh, I'll ask the guys, because, well, no, that's being sexy. It is you all. Do y'all remember some of the people that were on the dream team? Michael Jordan was on it. And, uh, Barkley, Magic, and, 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 that, and that white boy from Boston boy, Larry Bird, you know, the team was so powerful. 
that uh, they played eight games, and the closest that anybody got averaged 44 points. And they called them what? The dream team. And that's who you are. <laughs> From all that I have read, let me make sure I got it right, that this interfaith gathering here is, is a dream team. The Rhode Island Interfaith Coalition to Reduce Poverty is part of God's dream team. And that's why I'm so honored and proud to be with you. That, now, that's the way I see you. I may, I may have the wrong idea, but I, I, I get the impression that I am talking now to the people who, if they receive cosmic companionship in their work, as Dr. King talked about, will actually allow the future glory of the state of Rhode Island to be written in the history books. Listen, that, that could be hyperbole or it could be the truth. That, that the folks I'm talking to right now. And uh, you're only about 300, but that this group. If indeed you are linked with cosmic companionship in your work, that the history of the state of Rhode Island will register that whereas there were periods in the past that brought shame, and I don't need to, I read traces of the trait, okay? I met with Ms. Brown that was putting it together and all. I don't know all about that. But this group is capable of making more significant than the horror of the slave participation. The beginning at the time when the nation needed a radical transformation, or as Dr. King says, if America is to be on the right side of the world revolution, she needs to undergo a radical revolution of values. The way I see you is that you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, you may allow or encourage or inspire or empower your state to be at the forefront of what helped to turn things around towards the recovery of some of the foundations of our democratic society. So all that, that's just my way of saying I'm glad to be here. That's my way of saying I'm glad to be here with you. Now, I looked at the program and I see that I am gathering you at the end and then maybe send you forth. But I was taught as a homiletics professor that before you take off the plane, you always need to know where your landing spot is. So I want to tell you where I plan to land and I would like to hope that you will be able to land with me. So, here's the way I plan to end. Right there, just before noon, whenever they put out the time, time stamp. I want to end this way. I want to end with the song. And the song goes something like this. We are one in your spirit. We are one in your love. Be good, be good. All around, below. And above, there's no one anywhere that's excluded from your care. Thy will, thy will be done. The reason I'm going to sing it a second time is that way you can remember it and practice.
practice it so when we get to the end, we won't have to, you know, scramble to make sure. So let me sing it one more time, and I'm going to ask you to sing it with me. And it's not that we are one in spirit, well, and we pray that you're going to do it. It's not, not that we are one in the spirit. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
She was aware that he had impacted me, and even my call to ministry was re related to his ministry, and she put that right on top. On the way to New York, I read that book. And because I was Pentecostal in background, though American Baptist and UCC have claimed me since, <laughs> I read something at the bottom of page 104 up to the top of 105. And it said, and this was the only major reference I had heard from Dr. King that reflected his pneumatology, his doctrine of the Spirit. It said, the Holy Spirit is the continuing community-building force that moves through history. To continue community, no, I didn't say community building, the community creating force which moves in history. Which suggests that it does not matter sometimes what the condition is in the world, or whether we're in good times, or whether we're in bad times, or whether we're under one administration, or whether we're under other administration, there is a force that is committed to the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven. And that force neither slumbers nor sleeps. That even when we, for self-protective purposes, have retreated from the frontier of social justice or social transformative ministry, that spirit is still working on achieving the conditions that God had in mind as far back as the first day of creation. So that's where the theme comes from. The Spirit's war against poverty. Now I'm going to move along fairly briefly. The first, let me see if I can tell you sort of what the outline is going to be of what I'm going to be talking about as best I can discern. I think I'm going to talk first to you about why poverty is an abomination in the sight of God. And I then want to say something about really what I mean about the Holy Spirit is the continuing community creating force that moves through history. And then I want to drop some Bible passages that I would hope you would consider in the course of the year that Bible study of the Holy Spirit's war against poverty. Then I'd like out of my own particular tradition to the gospel, and otherwise, I want to do a case study of the Holy Spirit's war against poverty. And at that, including internal resistance to the Spirit's agenda. And then I want to say something about the practical implications for us of the Spirit's war against poverty. And maybe say a few words about an action agenda yes. for the work we have to do. So that's what I'm going to try to do. If I get off course, tell me what I said I was going to say. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I want to talk about, and I, and, and by the way, I'm usually a very energetic preacher. Yeah. <laughs> But today, don't measure what I say by the energy that I bring. Maybe let's let insight be our key concern. Why poverty is an abomination in the sight of God. Just outlining it now. Number one, poverty 
disrupts the flow of creation. By creating a destructive imbalance in life's processes. I will read it. It is poverty disrupts the flow of creation by creating a destructive imbalance in life's processes. And it, it bunches up stuff over here and pulls it from over there and sets up systems that perpetuate the imbalance and constricts the flow of creation itself. God doesn't like it. <laughs> Poverty hinders people from fulfilling their destiny. Basically, it even interferes with the metabolic process. It messes with brain development. Yeah. It stunts the growth of limbs and organs and aspirations. And consequently, since there's an opposite and equal reaction, poverty stimulates the impulse towards violent conflict. Poverty is a weapon of mass destruction where people die from it than from all the wars going on simultaneously. says, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world as far as the eye of God can see. Darkness covered everything. Blacker than a hundred midnights of cypress swamp. And then God made all of these other things and says, I'm lonely still. I'll make me a man. I'll make me a person. I'll make me a human being. I'll make me a community. The purpose for the whole thing of which we are part was that there might be a beloved community. So then, the other thing that poverty does is that it works against the creation of the beloved community. If I didn't say anything else, but just close up my Bible and go home, yo! If poverty does that, Heartbeat of God is impacted by the existence of these factors, this disruption, this destruction, this hindering, this 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 violence building thing, this weapon, this and God. to God. Yes. That's right. Let me ask you this. If it matters to God, people of faith, does, not only does it matter to you? Yes. They say, they say this is a group that if it matters to God, it matters to you. Yes. Like, as I said earlier, don't worry now. Don't, don't, don't get in despair. I, don't take no more medicine today. <laughs> the Spirit is the continuing community creating force that moves through history. 
There is constant spiritual warfare against poverty since it matters so much to God. Yeah. The spirit, night and day, mm. is at work. Mm. We are not rest until something's done about it. Spirit keeps you working in the interest of freeing up creation, releasing the power of life from the strangulating restrictions and constrictions, liberating people from bondage to deprivation and want, ending the various forms of destruction from the sinister symptoms of poverty and overcoming all the forces at work to block the upbuilding of the beloved community. So that's good news. Spirit's work. There are several biblical images I'd like to just throw out there. I won't have time to be exhaustive about them. But I'd like to throw them out there. First of all, just jot these down if you want to. Because this is interfaith, I begin with my own tradition, but I want to be very inclusive. Let's start. Basically, I started with Jesus with Luke 4, 14 through 21. Let's drop that one down. Do Isaiah 61, 1 through 4, but also make sure you go back and then read all the way down 1 through 11. But, but just in case you don't get sufficient clarity, Read Isaiah 58, 1 through 14. And while you're at it, go way back to the beginning. Go back to Genesis 15, when the Abrahamic tradition got started with Father Abraham and Mama Sarah. And then come back and read the earlier verses of Jeremiah 18 down in the Potter's house. And then I'll say these other two until later on. Let me say a word or two about each one of these. First of all, so that then Jesus got started on his ministry and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and opened up the book on the roll of the scroll, really, and found the place where it says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's part of the Spirit's warfare, all right? <laughs> so, so my whole faith, my whole faith, if I call myself a Christian, I know we got Christians, Jews, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, dog. I mean, all of us are in here together. But from my perspective, I cannot qualify to be in an interfaith setting without acknowledging that my faith required me to acknowledge that the brother when he got up to announce what his platform was on the day of his inauguration declared, well, in fact, he had it so well he could have sung it. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed the spirit of the jubilee, God has sent good news to the poor and ordered the captives free. The eyes of the blind must be opened. We must bind up each broken heart, hands that oppress, must learn how to heal. Right now is the time to start. Rejoice, the day of God's favor has arrived as Isaiah foretold. Now, as these words are spoken, a new age replaces the old. He could have sung an aria about it. Oh, a new age is coming. 
you know, come to me. You, you can't be what I'm claiming to be. You can't wear this label if you're not deeply committed and sensitive and responsive to the spirit's warfare against poverty. And I guess maybe in the interest of time, that was at the beginning. And at the end, the same brother, just before he's even getting ready to be crucified, tells this story. I have to paint a picture. In the judgment, he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But when I was hungry, I you. And I was naked, you didn't give me any clothes. I was in prison, you didn't even, I was, the prison industrial complex kept you out. Uh -huh. you, 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 and they said, Lord, when did we see all these things happen? He said, inasmuch as you did not do it for the least of these, you didn't do it for me. Get, 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 get out of my face. <laughs> well, but did you hear what he said when he sang that as Isaiah foretold? So you go back to Isaiah 61. Let me tell you, if you get back to that one, you discover that this was not new with him, which is to suggest that Christians who think that the poverty program got started with LBJ and Jesus, that's not right. <laughs> it's been wrong. Okay, okay, it's been wrong. In fact, a fascinating thing to me is how we overlooked it. For example, When you read and study Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord was there too. What are you doing? For, I'm engaged in our warfare. And the very words speak about how there is to be deliverance of the oppressed. I should have asked for a lavalier mic because I kind of walk around sometimes, but I didn't, so they would keep me right here, so I am right here. But, 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 but if I'm staying here... Back to the grandma. 
For 50 years, I preached a sermon about Joseph. And it was only this year, and I'm 81 years old. I discovered that when Joseph discloses who he is to these brothers, that God makes clear, listen Joseph, you thought this dream was about you, it really wasn't about you. You were just a part of the dream team. <laughs> Reality is, the reason I sent you here, and he gives three reasons. One is that you might preserve life. The second reason was that you might preserve a posterity of your own people. And then he finally said, go and get your dad and bring him down. And, and, and he says, because I want you to send for them. For the famine is in the land. And if you don't send for them, they will come to poverty. That was the first time in my whole life that I had ever noticed. I thought, it's like I said, I thought LBJ started the anti poverty program. God has been concerned about poverty all these years. There, there is no Johnny Come Lately nature. We put the organization together a few years ago. But God's been concerned about, I don't want the coach to come to poverty because I hate poverty. I can't stand poverty. Poverty is an abomination in my sight. I don't, I don't like poverty. Y'all got to do something about it. You got to do something about it. You got to help the state to do something so that the state once again can lead the United States. I mean, the whole democratic thing got started up in this general area. Y'all got to start it again. I mean, the reason it got, listen, sometimes the battery goes dead. The battery of democracy seems to be <laughs> Somebody got the case. Anybody got a case? Jump a table. The Rhode Island has a jump a table. The somehow stop the idea of democracy all over again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some, some, somebody's got to help us. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let, let, sometimes you have to go back to your notes. I'll tell you why. Because when you get my age, it's like this. If you, <laughs> sometimes, if your mind is still reminding you of things that you forgot, it shows that your mental faculties are not completely shot. The names and numbers per people and hide inside your head. It shows that those you're losing it, you're not completely dead, but I better get back on my notes. Genesis to mess with Joseph, but the idea, if you want to know what God is concerned about, just dare to read Isaiah 58. You keep praying to me as if, if when you put that as if in it, it means God is concerned about counterfeit religion. You can do all of these things like you're the real thing. You're not concerned about poverty. You realize that you're even challenging me to take the homeless poor into my house. Look, I, I got to care for security for my family. <laughs> well, if you can't take them in your house, then make sure there's adequate housing for them. Yeah. I just thought I'd add that in. But let me suggest to you that. Um, Abraham, come. You will be blessed. Now, the reason I'm blessing you is not just because you're the greatest. In fact, you were not necessarily the greatest. The reason, I, the reason I'm going to bless you, and the way you will know that I have blessed you, is that through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, I bless largely in order that you might participate in my poverty program. Mm -hmm. The reason I bless you is so that you will be in a position 
to be a blessing because I want a creation that strangulated by poverty. I'm going to bless you. And anybody here who's blessed, I'm blessed. But in order to really say that God blessed me, some folk bless themselves. In order to know that God blessed me, I have to get my confirmation through the way in which I become an instrument of blessings to others. Otherwise, the formula is off. Well, why don't I just come on down with me to Jeremiah 18 to the Father's house. And then I'm going to show you a part of working on a wheel. And the vessel is marred in the pot's hand. So what does God lovingly do? He mashes it down. Oh. What happens, my family was taught that if it's bad, you've got to look into the hands of God to see what God's doing with it. Because God specializes in taking bad situations and doing something with it. Could it be that insofar as our nation was a vessel in the hand of the Creator. Could the experience at the potter's house say it is not only our apostasy, it is not only our selfishness, it is not only our ruthlessness. One way of looking at the emerging conditions in our present climate. Oh, could it be that we are being mashed down? Hopefully not for extinction. But if we don't do something like this climate, this is, that's what it's going to be. But, but hope that this is God's Imagine it now. I don't quite like the way the United States of America is shaping up. There's some things that, it, that this vessel, this vessel can't stand the bottom ain't right of it. Could it be that it's a mashing down to get ready for a reshaping and that the Rhode Island Interfaith Coalition is a part of the redesigning team of what a genuine democratic society can look like. But maybe the mashing down occasions a redesign and a rebuilding of new possibilities. I just look at it.
the Episcopal Church has a key role. And if, if, if your wife has your stuff, she, she, she's going to help to to make the nation proud of its Rhode Island heritage. Okay, so I'm glad about that. Thing. But anyway, I had the honor of, it's a funny thing, can you believe a boy from Burgon, North Carolina, gets to be trained with Rockefeller money. <laughs> so I got a theological education scholarship that helped me to graduate from you. Then when I graduated, the graduation ceremony was at the Rockefeller Church, the Riverside Church. And that just on May 3rd, I had, and I was proud. So let me, I, I would usually brag. I was proud to have the honor to do the eulogy for David Rockefeller. Miss Richmond, where are you? Rich, you know, being poor, you sometimes get contemptuous of rich people. <laughs> but having had a chance to work with David Rockefeller, I learned something particularly at his funeral. I, Mr. Rockefeller was one of the nice, he was rich enough to be nice the first day. I mean, you got enough money before they But there was something unusual about him, so that at the funeral, the Lord revealed to me the reason he's so special is that his family taught him while he, while he and the brothers were young. They had Bible study because John D. Rockefeller Jr. was a good Baptist. Rhode Island, y'all had anything to do with the development of the Baptist tradition? This is amazing how your legacy continues to impact. But anyway, they had to learn lessons. And one of the lessons Johnny Rockefeller had to teach, they had Bible study every morning before they could have breakfast. You believe that? One of the things he learned was that you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I'm sure they taught them what I used to call the great commandment. From is the greatest commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as you love yourself. So I thought that what made David like I was so significant it was that he really loved his father. So he tried to manage the resources of his family and to be a good steward. And Chase Manhattan would say he was that. But he also tried to recognize that if his name was David, he wanted to be a man after God's own heart. So his style reflected trying to honor his earthly father and his heavenly parent as well for the combination. So, this is, this is, so the Lord says to me, the reason that for him, his greatness involved a greater greatness, and that is he tried to live by the platinum rule. Well, what's the platinum rule? Well, we know what the golden rule is. The golden rule is now, um, do unto others as you would have, have them do unto you. The platinum rule is to live in such a way that you honor the great commandment of the Lord thy God, don't hug all my sons then. Love your neighbor, also love yourself. So anyone, and I am pausing now for a commercial, I am here to recruit each of us to make a commitment to live by the platinum rule. The platinum rule is love yourself. You can't do much for others if you don't care for yourself. Because self gets a way to get itself in there anyway. Altruism is not all generous. They're not all true. Almost always got some self up in it. You philanthropists know that to be the case. The reality is. Well, the way I put it, I'm a novice when it comes to receiving. Giving has become my enemies. But giving alone without getting becomes soon a fatal disease. 
If the intake valve is not open, there's no way to maintain a supply. There comes a point in the cycle of the outgo extreme runs dry. Straining out love from a vacuum is like drinking from the heart of a stone. Try as you may, at the end of the day, you're exhausted, frustrated, alone. Better to give than receive, we've been taught. But another truth I've learned just by living, only the soul that the grace to receive excels in the fine art of giving. So the point is, you've got to love yourself. A whole lot of people involved in this work of trying to help the poor don't even care about yourself, not with enlightened self-interest. You've got to love yourself. Love yourself. And then you got to give. you got, you got, you got to love your neighbor, too. If you, you love it. I said that. Correct my grammar. I said, use a small package. I should have said, you borrow a small package. It didn't sound right. You, <laughs> you don't love anybody but your own self, your own little shriveled up self. And then you're not going to do much for others. You've got to learn to feel good about yourself. But then you've got to learn to give to others. I teach my grandbaby that. That's the first thing I ever taught my little grandbaby. Hannah Rose is her name. By the way, she named my son named her Hannah Rose from that sermon I preached on Hannah Rose. Anyway, I picked her up from a little bit of baby. Every time I saw her, I'd sing this song. I made heaven so happy today, receiving God's love and giving it away. When I looked up, heaven smiled at me. Now I'm so happy, can't you see? I'm happy, look at me, I'm happy, can't you see? Shadow makes me happy, except I'm happy too. I'm happy, look at me, I'm happy, can't you see? Let me show my happy, loving smile with you. So the teacher and the first sentence I ever heard her say was happy. It is something that in giving one experiences the happiness that flows from loving self and loving others. But loving God supremely means loving the audience, mind and soul and the strain and all of that stuff. Things loving God supreme. You must make sure that no matter what you love yourself, neighbors, and others, that nothing matters more to you than your relationship with God. Now that, that's living by the platinum rule. Your party is not more important than your God. If it is, you have party apostasy. Your race is not more important than God. If so, you got racial idolatry. Your gender, your ethnicity, your ideology, your social vocation. To be living by the platform, loving God supremely, loving yourself, and you may be too. I'd like to recruit people. Please, if you are willing to join and try to live by the platinum rule, please sign on your heart. But anyway, finally, a case study. A case study of the Holy Spirit's war against poverty. I'm going to do this very rapidly. So that I don't do like I used to do. Remember times preachers get to preaching sometimes, and you get to preaching and it gets so good that the points of implementation and action get left out in the euphoria of the celebration of how good your sermon was. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I got to save myself some time to talk about the practical implications of this war and maybe an action agenda. But anyway, let me briefly say this. This, 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 you won't have time to write this down. Being a Pentecostal, I grew up where everybody loved Acts, of, the Acts chapter 2. By the way, when is Pentecost this year? When, when, June, June the 4th? Well, it's coming soon, right? Pentecost is coming. We loved Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place and all on one accord, and there was a sound of a mic. Well, I, 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 I wish I had a prayer crowd. <laughs> old preachers used to say, and the Holy Spirit came down. We love that because we saw the Spirit of God. Tongues of fire set on everybody. The, and, and they began to speak in tongues as, as the Spirit gave the love and said, and everybody.
everybody thought that these people were so euphoric, they thought they were drunk. Peter stands up and says, these are not drunk. And he says, these are not as drunk as you think they are. These are not drunk as you suppose. This is what the so for. This is that which Joel spoke about in the last days. I pour out my spirit upon all this. We love that part. The reason my tradition didn't make it quite yet into the whole thing is we forgot that the whole purpose of the thing was not Acts chapter 2 part 1 but Acts chapter 2 part 2 the evidence that the spirit had come was that what our Jewish family had taught us before we Christians even got started when there's supposed to be a jubilee when things are supposed to get right all over again the life the Lord arranged it from the beginning. And so we forget that after the day of Pentecost and all these people joined the church, then they went from house to house breaking bread and with prayer. And if anybody had needs, their needs were met before everybody else felt like they had everything they needed. The day of Pentecost was, was verified by the creation of the simulation of the beloved community with its jubilee, the of liberty and justice for all. That's what made Pentecost significant. Not Acts chapter 2 part 1, but the part 2 that emerged out of it. That's where the good stuff was. A creation of the beloved community, which is why God created the earth in the first place, that we might be one. How I want to confess. They said, Forbes, you didn't cross yourself with the right. You Catholics have to teach us how I mean, you should do it just with the right hand like that. We, 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 we were not quite able to do all we should have done. Well, first of all, as a result of what happened on the day of Pentecost, there was an addressing of poverty. When you lay this beauty, this man at the gate, and he's blind from his birth. He's a pauper. That's why they take him to the temple every day. He's poor. And I, man, why did I overlook that he was poor? All I could think about is blind. No, this is this is this is the biblical way of telling folks that the Holy Spirit's warfare is going on now. That the Holy Spirit has come. So they this poor the poor man. This poor man. We overlook the poverty. We would even prefer to look at the blindness and overlook the poverty. That's because we are blind so often to the reality of the conditions that people are actually struggling under. So then Peter goes by and the Lord lets them be poor. I'm so glad they were poor. You know why they were poor? They had been to the noonday prayer, they had taken up an offering, and they had been moved with such generosity that they had given everything they had. The reason for this was that most of the time when we get ready to address problems, we have to do a feasibility study. Is there enough money to afford to feed the poor? Is there enough money to give them meds to stay alive? Is there enough money to make, build the housing project? Is there enough money for the educational program? Can you have uh, vouchers for private schools and can't pay for public schools and all of that kind of stuff. You know, all, the, the, so the Lord said, I want to show you that when I get ready to heal, you don't have to do a feasibility study as to whether the budget can afford it or not. Don't even worry about it. So here the man looks up at them and says, sir, I represent the poverty conditions in the world and I'm, I'm blind too. But can you help me out? And Peter says, oh, they said, oh, I'm sorry. It's not feasible for us to help you. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That the Lord instituted a, a, a single-payer health care program right there on the spot. Right there. It's not that funny. God would give us the capacity to be healers even if it didn't seem to be economically feasible to do so. Anyway, anyway. But, but what I wanted to say, is, and, and, and I really must close because you have to have time for conversation and I have already done the hour that was allotted to me. So let me scoot right through this. 
Many Christians did not do a good job of modeling what the interfaith community ought to do. Because they had several problems, which I want to mention, and then I think I should bring this to a close at this section. Number one. <coughs> We discovered that sociological patterns perdure beyond our awareness. So when they started distributing all this wonderful stuff that the Pentecostal spirit had released in them and the Jubilee resources had been gathered, the Greek widows discovered that they were being neglected in the daily administration. Folks, don't worry about whether you're prejudiced, whether you're racist, whether you mean all of that. No, watch these systems that have shaped us to be today. Yeah. Because these systems work night and day. Systems don't take off, by the way. Systems don't, no, systems don't have vacations. Systems don't take vacations. They, they don't have off days. Systems work all the time. They found out that the system was stronger than their new impulses from their Pentecostal experiences. So you got to, if the Pentecost comes, Pentecostal people have to work on the systems that continue to work day and night until you can change things in the spiritual warfare game. Also, notice another thing, that the that power of, 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 of money is so strong that Ananias and Sapphira, they, they said, they, they, these people were very generous. The Holy Ghost has moved them to give up stuff so that there can be redistribution of resources. But that problem was, in North Carolina is where I'm from. Our state motto is, is uh, Esse Quam Badil. I hope my Latin is right, to be rather than to see. Some folks like to see. Right. And Ananias and Sapphira like to see, like they were doing it. It was a deadly experience yes. for both of them. And Simon, Simon Lagos, Simon the Great, he saw what the Holy Spirit was doing. He said, I'd like to have that power. I see some commodification possibilities in this thing. <laughs> You, you would call them business, man. That's what I'm trying to say is that no matter how much Holy Spirit you got, the Holy Spirit has to do warfare against us before the Holy Spirit can put us on the dream team to do warfare against poverty. Because he's got this to get into it. Simon Peter on the housetop couldn't go to the Gentiles, so the Holy Spirit arranged a thing. By the way, that's a good sermon. The thing. That they said the thing was that down four foot and be stuff. It wasn't even kosher, man. But they said, rise, be killing me. And he said, oh, no, no. He wasn't talking about eating that food. He was talking about, you got to treat Gentiles with respect. Just because somebody's gay. Uh oh. Uh oh. Or just because somebody's Gentile. Or just because somebody's a woman. Or just because somebody's a Muslim. Or just because someone is a city. You, you, look, what I have cleansed, don't you come around sticking your dirty paws of ideological proclivity on top of it. So, so anyway, the Holy Spirit has to liberate us from our impoverished imaginations where we can only see ourselves as acceptable in the sight of God. My time is up. So I think I'm going to end just reading these off. What are the practical implications of the Spirit's war against poverty? That you might not be able to get these down because I'm reading these fast. We must be willing to be a member of the Spirit's dream team. We must take the pledge. Lord, if you want somebody, here am I send me. We must be sensitized to the deep evils of poverty and show compassion toward the poor. We must become a part of the resistance, the resistance within ourselves, the resistance in our churches and mosques and synagogues, 
but resistance in our own political party, resistance in our nation. We must register for active duty, report for daily duty in the struggle, in the warfare. We must elect leaders who honor God's call to work to fight against poverty. Don't elect leaders that don't honor that call. Uh, we must get to know the poor and their plight. But not only their poor and their plight, but their promise, their contributions, their gifts. Because yeah. poor folks are more than poor. Because God slipped some stuff in them that ought not to be there according to our normal sociological and psychological analysis. They got some heaven sent blessedness stuck up in the midst of their poverty. We got to see that too. We got to get to know them. And also we have to make sacrificial uh, contributions and renunciations towards a more equitable balance of distributions. We've got to invest in out in cultivating the values that lead to the building of the beloved community. All these things we got to do. Now, let me read some things. I was having a list that I put together and came here and discovered that in your program, you got a better list than I have. Because your list is concrete about legislative agendas getting ready to happen right here in this state. That's a better list. But let me add a few to your list, all right? I like your list. I'm going to add it to my list. Could you add these things to your list? Some random acts of kindness every day. Every day, do something for somebody that needs it. Adopt a family. Have the billionaires show that you own it. You, you can't be a fully honorable billionaire without adopting a, 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 a poor family. So your family can be liberated from its myopia regarding its privileged position. Adopt a family, get to know the family. Have an agency put together to help people sort it out because you can't do this at random. Giving money is a hard job. Don't do it with efficiency, I know that. But, but, but for, suppose every in New York City, all of you, suppose each one would adopt a family. They would learn so much that they would be willing to engage in system change once they discover what these people go through and what it's like. I even found out, I tried to do something about my mortgage, but I had some unfortunate circumstances. Couldn't even get the bank to trust me. I told them I got some backers that are helping They said, well, you know, we'll get in trouble if we loan to you. People that need it are the last ones to get it because the system has been organized to justify the degree to which we're going to sustain our exploitation of these people. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just want to have a leg up ministry. Uh, my own, the own pro pro purpose of this ministry is give a leg up to somebody that needs it. Have a systems uplift mission. Do domestic Marshall Plan. Do a tax abatement program. So that every businessman that gets some kind of special arrangement have an opposite and equal one that a poor person gets some arrangement to. Have an arts enrichment opportunity program so that, uh, that the opera houses are not living white all the time. Have a technological preparedness scholarship program. Do a sector targeted scholarship program. Areas where poor people are systematically excluded, then have a special arrangement to get them included. Have a state, local, and poverty audit. You are already done it. We're getting ready to do it, Reverend Bob. We're going to try to get a national audit. In 1968, they had the Kerner Commissioner report. 50 years later, we need another audit on global, national, and uh, regional areas. Have an extended family care health care plan. Wouldn't it be something if I'm so big and bad and rich myself that I could have an arrangement that I could put a poor person on my policy? Ooh, that would be great. What about a poor people's hotline emergency line? What about an emergency benevolence fund generated all over again at double the level that most benevolence programs? I always just put a dollar in the benevolence offer. That ain't going to get it right. What about a needs referral agency? People can't ask for it, but people find out there's a need and can say there's a need over there. What about, oh, I like this, a Against the Arts Awards program. I'm on the board of Children's Defense Fund. We have an event against uh, uh, 
uh, against the odds of wars program. What about service emergency opportunity? Around our Christmas holidays time, have special jobs. Clean out your garage. They, a garage day. And, and pay, pay me, a poor preacher, to come in and clean up your room so I can buy some food for my kids for Thanksgiving instead of your turkey you're going to give them, okay? What about a training program for unmet needs? And so forth and so on and so forth and so on. I could go on. In fact, I have gone on. But I got to <laughs> Specifically, one of the questions referenced um, Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam sermon that was preached at Riverstone and how he spoke about uh, racism, militarism, materialism, and the intersection of those systems in poverty. Lots of people wanted to hear some more about the systems that affect poverty and then how faith groups could address systems. Faith groups are very good at um, relief which is kind of a short-term uh, response, but what about longer-term um, engagement so that the system is transformed? So say a little bit more about systems and how faith groups can transform those systems and invite people to transform those systems. Does that make sense? Excellent. I think that if we remember that each person is a system, meaning there are many components that make up the body, and that each of the organs or organ systems impacts the other. That the mind is impacted by the spirit, is impacted by the body, and that what you do to one part impacts the others it then frees us up from too narrow a focus and we have to ask what happens to the whole body? So you can enter the problems of justice and poverty at any one point but you have to ask yourself where does this point connect impact, transform, influence the other points. And if I want to see changes take place, I must hope that I dig deeply enough that I am not simply touching the surface and leaving the larger body largely unattended to. The way Paul looked at it, he talked about we are many different members in the body and that one part might be inclined to think that I'm the only important part, but that you really can't do one without the other. My father explained it this way. When he went to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital to have open heart surgery, he had to have a valve replaced. When he got ready to have the valve replaced, he could not have the surgery because his temperature kept spiking. So my son his son, my brother, Ronnie, 
went to visit him. And in his visitation, Ronnie said, Daddy, um, when I saw you smile, I noticed that you have a red gum there. Can I look in your mouth? Ronnie looked in his daddy's mouth and saw that there was gum infection. He then had the physicians look and sure enough, they gave him the antibiotics necessary to clear up what was in his mouth because what was in his mouth was preventing him from getting attention to what was going on in his heart. I think faith groups will be inclined to say, now, okay, we're going to give a little handout. No, we're going to give a turkey this Christmas to all the families. But what about the context that created the need for the turkey to be given in the first place. So whatever we do, let's hope that we are not healing the problem lightly or attempting to heal something for which infection in the rest of the system is robbing us of it. So we are inclined to look holistically. So the word salvation actually is related to wholeness. So you're going to help one problem, what about the whole body? And I think the Holy Spirit's anti-poverty program is saying God wants the whole body to be well. And if God wants the whole body, this group over here is going to have a task force on this one, but they better be in conversation with the task force on that so that each one of the workshops we just had, each one is as important as the other and the fact that we are working on it individually, but also collectively, gives us a great prospect of being Exhibit A of what the various other states in the Union ought to be doing. Do what Rhode Island is doing, because they approach things with systemic understanding, and they do strategic planning, and they're going to make a difference here, here, and here, and the overall effect is this might be the best state in the union to come to when you get through. So maybe that's enough to answer that question with some confidence. Now, I think maybe that's the only question I'm going to get a chance to respond to because I'm a systems thinker and I'm getting hungry. <laughs> and 1230 is the time when we're supposed to feed that part of the system, and I don't want to get in the way of that. So is it time for me to give my closing comments? Well, you already know it's landing time. You kind of know where we're going to land. Um, let me see. I think I owe it to my mother to close out before we sing our song. My mother, Mabel Forbes, had eight kids. But at a certain point, she said, I can't even keep up with all your kids. But at the time we were growing up, we all had meals together. So when we sat down, my mother developed this ritual. She would ask, are all the children in? And if somebody was not present, we had to, and I know I should stay prepared, but I thought when I go ahead and tell the truth with my advice, we had to fix a plate, not prepare, fix a plate for the child that was not present, put it in the oven before we could prepare our own place and then say grace because Everyone was included. I like to think that God is mama eternal. Yeah. And when we sit down for our meal, mama eternal likes to ask, is everybody are all 
your children in, and if somebody is not present, you have to fix a play or fix a system that will allow a play to be fixed so that we can offer thanks to God. Because we are one in your spirit. We are one in your love. Deep within, all around, below, and above. There's no one anywhere that's excluded from your care. Thy will, thy will be done. And this time, since it's closing, we're going to ask you to stand and put a gesture with it. So remember the gesture of our song. Okay, so when we say deep within, we place our hands over there. All around, below, and above. There's no one anywhere that's excluded from your care. Thy will. Thy will be done. We are one in your spirit. We are one in your love. Deep within, all around, below and above. There's no one anywhere that's excluded from your care. Go forth in the name of the Lord to spread glad tidings abroad. The love that you share and the witness you bear will bring honor and glory to God. Go forth with a joyful amen until we gather again. Remember the word your spirit has heard. God's love is the hope of the world. Amen. amen.